Every day, you and I get bombarded with negative news. Just like the body becomes what we eat, the mind becomes what we're putting in. It is important to listen to stories that not only gives you hope, but also inspires you and uplifts you. In this podcast, we're interviewing experts who will break down the solutions to the world's most pressing problems. And I promise you, if you listen to this podcast, you will not only stay informed, but you will also feel more energy in your life. Welcome to Great.com Talks with... Today we have invited the executive director and CEO of CAPE, and CAPE stands for Canadian Association of Physicians for the Environment. And our guest here is called Robin Edger. And Robin, I want to say welcome to this conversation about human health and connected to the environment that I, I assume that we're going to get into this conversation. So, so welcome to this conversation. Thank you for having me. Yes, if I dive directly into to, um, a question that's on my mind when I think of CAPE is, um, could you help me and the listener to understand why climate change is an important problem that doctors and, and physicians would address uh, if they want to try to improve the life qualities of people? Sure, yeah, thanks. So the Canadian Association of Physicians for the Environment is a national member-based organization. We're physician-directed, uh, but we have, we have physician and non-physician members. Our main focus is on the intersection between human health and environmental health, uh, because we know, we know that the health of the environment affects uh, human health very profoundly. Uh, in particular, we focus on issues like climate change, and we know that climate change, uh, the World Health Organization calls climate change the greatest threat to human health of the 21st century. And it's, it's already impacting us here in Canada. Um, things from uh, extreme weather events and the, the injuries and deaths that can result from that um, and the mental health impacts. Um, issues like uh, you know, we, we've seen incidences of Lyme disease and West Nile and uh, other vector-borne diseases increase over time as it gets warmer and warmer in Canada and these, these uh, car- carriers and insects are able to thrive. Uh, and then other impacts, uh, even beyond climate change, uh, air quality impacts our health very profoundly as well. Uh, we know, uh, we, you know, we did a recent report uh, and we worked with some energy economists where we showed that we took a model that Health Canada uses that shows that um, 14, uh, approximately 14,600 Canadians die prematurely every year uh, in part due to uh, air pollution. And we looked uh, over the course of the time period between 2030 and 2050 and looked at, you know, if Canada uh, took climate action to hit our climate targets, what would that mean in terms of lives saved? And what we were able to find was it would would mean approximately 112,000 lives would be saved, which is a huge figure. That's about the size of Waterloo. So uh, it's important for our physician members to uh, work on these issues because they care. They care about the health of the planet, and they also they care about the health of their patients, and that's who's being affected by this. Thank you. That that makes it more clear uh, to see the the problem and why we why you would target uh, climate change as a as a way to improve human life um, quality and, and health. Now you have been selected uh, to lead this organization uh, for um, an unknown period of time here, and so the background to why you been selected to this position as the executive director and CEO. Could you tell us a little bit about your background and uh, environmental? Um, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, because I'm not a doctor. A lot of times people presume I might be. Um, I did used to work as a civil servant in the Ontario government, and I worked in the Ministry of Health uh, most uh, recently as a senior advisor to the Deputy Minister of Health. So I do have that as a background. And then, uh, you know, in a future position, I ended up working, uh, running the Ontario region of a clean energy think tank called the Pembina Institute. And uh, we worked in Ontario specifically most on um, transportation decarbonization. So, uh, you know, switching our transportation system to one that's more sustainable, either through electrification or through uh, trip avoidance due to, you know, transit or 
uh, active transportation like walking and biking. Uh, and then we also looked at not even sort of personal transportation, but also um, how we move goods, because we know that uh, right now about 30% of uh, transportation emissions come from freight, uh, uh, mo mostly from heavy duty vehicles like class eight vehicles. So uh, we, we dealt with that issue there as well. So that I sort of have that joint health and environmental background, which uh, was why this was a dream job for me. Hmm. From having that background and now being in this position where you, I guess, uh, uh, you were actually making a change for people's health, uh, being uh, uh, with CAPE, uh, what do you think is important for people to understand? Is there anything that you would like people to understand about uh, human health, environment? You know, we, we think it's a particularly important time to be an advocate on this issue. We know that climate change is very urgent. I'm sure you saw the, the IPCC uh, UN report that made clear um, back in 2018 that we had 12 years to reorient our economy in order to uh, avoid the worst impacts of climate change. Uh, it's clear the scientific consensus is that we have to get to the point where we're cutting our global emissions in half by 2030 and zeroing out by 2050 if we're going to uh, maintain the kind of planet that we might want to live on. So it, it's a very urgent issue. And it's not, you know, climate change is not going to be solved because of one international agreement. We've seen the Kyoto Agreement be signed. We've seen uh, the Paris Agreement be signed. And emissions just go up. That our international uh, organizations do not have the strength to be able to solve this on their own. This this is an issue that's going to be solved uh, through thousands of national and subnational battles all over the world, and and we have to win them everywhere. So our feeling is, you know, we focus very strongly on um, the federal government and on provincial government uh, climate policy, and we advocate for better policy, and we do so in a way that I think makes the issue more tangible for people because we're not. You know, we're not talking about one and a half degrees of post-industrial warming or two degrees of post-industrial warming. It can be difficult to, to make that tangible, but uh, instead we're pointing out the impacts of climate change uh, or air pollution on your health and the health of your loved ones. And I, I think that really brings it home for people. Could you almost say that being in a position of a physician, um, you have some kind of expert knowledge that the government would listen to? And that's why you would be a, a suitable candidate to advocate for environmental issues to, to solve those. I think that's a great point. Although, you know, again, obviously I'm not a physician myself, but a lot of our, um, our best spokespeople are. Some of our board members uh, will be the ones who will speak either uh, with the media or they'll speak with um, public policy makers. And, and I agree with you. I think that um, physicians carry a lot of weight when they're talking about health issues. It's not always obvious to people why uh, environmental health is a human health issue, but once that uh, link is made clear for them, that, that lands very profoundly. So, you know, we, we know right now, for instance, that um, the federal government is set to spend money in order to recover from the economic disaster created by COVID uh, at levels that we haven't seen since World War II. And so we've been advocating that the government spend in a way that uh, transitions the economy to a sustainable economy. And we were able to do, do so in sort of uh, non-traditional ways. So I mentioned, you know, we, we laid out a plan that would have the government hit our climate targets. And I mentioned the, the lives gained just through air quality alone through that. Well, we're, we're kind of the only group that can bring that argument to the table. You know, we, we also worked with the economists to show that uh, that sort of plan would create 1.3 million jobs between 2030 and 2050, and that's also important. Um, but other, other groups kind of bring that piece to the table as well, where our uh, sort of unique addition to the conversation, I think, is the human health angle. Mm. If we would jump more into detail towards, uh, you said that it's not always obvious for people to understand the connection between uh, human health and environment. Uh, is there, um, could you help us to break that down even more? Is that possible? Sure, yeah. So, I mean, I, it's, there, there are just so many ways in which uh, 
our health is affected by the environment, just as, as it's affected by other uh, determinants of health, like um, socioeconomic status, et cetera. Um, but yeah, we, we know that, uh, you know, the expectation is that extreme heat days in Canada are going to double or triple in the coming decades. And we know that as those extreme heat days uh, increase, both in amount and in length, uh, we will see more heat-related deaths. And um, unfortunately, studies have shown that uh, that will hit the most impacted people for, like, it, it will impact the most uh, marginalized people first um, and most profoundly. So, you know, we, we know that um, uh, our health is going to be uh, continually impacted over the coming decades. It will be important to continue to articulate that because unfortunately, uh, humans, we, we tend to have a short memory when it comes to these things. It's like, uh, again, studies have been fairly clear that the, the new normal just sort of becomes normal relatively quickly. So it's going to be important that we articulate both um, how things are changing as they happen, and also uh, that we paint, uh, we sort of paint pictures of the future as, as, as they might happen depending on our choices. Um, so yeah, I, I hope that's helpful. Um, you're saying that the heat waves are gonna double or triple, uh, and I, now we're talking from Canadian point of view, and, and it's gonna be the same throughout the world. So this is an, an issue for everyone. Um, Right, so that that makes sense to understand then how that would cause, I guess, um, make it much worse for people with illness to deal with that heat wave, and I guess put more people into uh, threatening positions. Uh, yeah, and that would then increase the number of patients coming to uh, hospitals, and uh, so that's how I see it, at least in my mind. That. Um, yeah, and, and there and there can be some some very scary intersections between this and issues like the current you know pandemic. Like if if there's uh, and we've already seen it in certain areas around the world. Uh, thankfully, not not here yet. Where if there is a climate related disaster and um, people are forced out of their homes and they're forced into shared spaces, well, that that's about the last thing that we need during a pandemic where we're trying to keep everybody apart. So, so yeah, no, it's, it's, um, it's a scary time for public health generally right now and uh, climate related disasters just uh, make it worse. Part of your work, if I understood it correct here, um, I just read a small part on the website um, about you also wanna, like one of the projects that you're doing is educating physicians about the environmental perspective. Could you tell us more about why that will be important? Sure, yeah, because the, the thing is, um, when physicians went to medical school, they didn't learn, um, for the most part, about the links between environmental health and human health. Uh, you know, their, their main focus is on um, you know, curing the, the uh, patient populations that they, that they see, uh, rather than um, advocating for environmental uh, uh, change that will lead for their patient population is not to be sick in the first place. Um, now that that is uh, slowly changing because of uh, the great work of um, you know, volunteers in our organization. Uh, there's a very active uh, medical student association who's, who's uh, focused a lot on, on medical education and adding this, this element into it. Um, but in the absence of that, we can play a role in, in educating physicians um, both uh, on how uh, environmental issues will impact their patient populations, but also on how they can advocate for better environmental policy to make sure that it, it doesn't happen. So uh, we've put together a toolkit where uh, physicians can, can go online and there are many chapters. And as you would imagine, it's, it's very well, um, uh, there are a lot of resources and it's very well cited because our, our physician members uh, sort of require that level of, of evidentiary basis behind the claims that anyone would make. And uh, physicians can go through that toolkit and the chapters are, are thematically about various things. So if you're um, a doctor in one area of the country, say an urban area like Toronto, uh, it might make more sense for you to dive into the active transportation section because that's something that could potentially affect your 
clients very profoundly. Um, and an issue like that is great for physicians because generally speaking, a physician is going to tell you to get out of your car uh, and get onto your bike or, or walk as much as possible because that's good for your health, even in the absence of any um, environmental impacts. Um, but then, the, of course, the great thing is most people, their, their uh, carbon emission profile is a huge part of that is made up by the emissions from their vehicles. So, yeah, we, we take it very seriously, um, our responsibility to, to uh, educate physicians on these issues. And then those who find out about it, of course, are our greatest advocates as volunteers and board members um, and are able to create change and are able to, um, you know, in turn, educate their colleagues on the issues. I feel excitement thinking about uh, having more awareness in the physician's field because they already have that authority kind of power uh, when speaking about topics uh, that is important. And I assume that uh, every sector needs to do internal um, education and hearing that you are focusing on helping that sector, uh, physicians, um, I guess maybe there would be an um, you're adding to solving the problem in an angle that I guess not many people or organizations could do. So in that way, that, yeah, uh, that makes me excited to, to hear that this exists. I think that's right. One, well, we put a lot of trust in our health professionals, um, physicians, nurses, like we, you know, poll after poll, they'll have polls um, that ask the public who they're the most, uh, who the professions are that they trust. And the professions that always come first and second are nurses and doctors, usually in that order. And so, yeah, if, if we're, you know, we put so much trust in our health professionals and for good reason. Um, and if, you know, as an organization, if CAPE can bring together those physicians, and we also try to reach out as much as possible to other health professionals like uh, nurses and have them be advocates. Well, those, yeah, th those are, those are groups of people that we want to hear from, particularly on human health issues, which climate change is. So, so yeah, it's, it's, uh, it's an important, important job that I've got here and I, I'd like to have it. So far, um, it's easy for me to understand why policymakers would be uh, important players uh, um, in, in the work that Cape does and physicians. Uh, if you would talk towards the people, the normal people that, the dust, the, who are not doctors and how do they correlate to CAPE and the work that you do? How would you fit the, those people into the picture? Sure. So yeah, we would interact with the general public um, in a lot of different ways. Now, about two thirds of our members are actually not physicians. Uh, so even just, you know, the emails that we send out, the meetings, we have regional meetings across the country of our volunteers. Uh, many of those people would not be health professionals that we would be interacting with um, and that help us out. They're, they're just people who um, I think are, uh, they understand that, that uh, climate change is a human health issue. They're passionate about uh, the work that we do. Uh, but then also we're, uh, we're fairly lucky in that we're able to generate um, uh, media interest in a lot of the work that we do. So, you know, we'll put out a report recently. Uh, I mentioned we put out the, what we call a healthy recovery report, which is very focused on uh, recommendations for the federal government on how they can spend uh, their uh, economic recovery funds in a way that will transition us to a sustainable economy. Um, and when we put out reports like that, we'll, we'll write uh, op-eds that will get picked up in newspapers and we'll, we'll do interviews with uh, the media, both um, you know podcasts and uh, television and radio. And, and we, we tend to have a really good pickup, I think in part because we're talking about the issue in such a tangible way. So I think if, if you're a member of the media, um, it's, you know that your readership is going to be very interested to hear about impacts on their health and their loved ones. Um, perhaps you're less likely to kind of retread the, um, the stories that make it maybe a little less tangible, you know, or are talking about polar bears or something where it's, it's a bit more of a niche, um, interest, I suppose, although I, I'm very interested in that, obviously. Um, and then I think we're also lucky in that, uh, although not every newspaper across the country has an environmental reporter, although that some do and that's growing, uh, they all have health reporters. So often 
uh, were able to, to uh, speak with the health reporters at the various newspapers across the country. And, um, and that's kind of neat because then this story is showing up in a part of the paper that you're not necessarily used to seeing it. You know, it's, it's in the health section, um, which is important because it is a health issue. So yeah, we, we would tend to uh, interact with the public that way. And then of course, more and more, it's also through social media, uh, whether it's you know, Twitter uh, or Instagram or Facebook, uh, more and more people are interact interacting with us that way. We produced a, um, a social media video that we launched at the same time as our report that last time I checked has been viewed by 75,000 people through our various platforms. Um, which is quite a bit more reach than I think we've sort of ever had in the past just by developing a, a report and putting it out there because not, not everyone is willing to read a 30 page report. And I get that <laughs> we, we all have busy lives, uh, but a lot of people are willing to watch a 90 second video and, and at least, you know, get the main, the main points. So yeah, lots of different ways to interact with the public um, and including like podcasts like this. So yeah, we're always, we're always happy you know, when we get these invitations. And climate change and human health is a topic that relates to everyone. So supporting CAPE and supporting the mission that you're doing is actually supporting my own life and so on. So if people would like to support the work that you're doing, what kind of support is needed in this? Sure. So we, I mean, first and foremost, we need your energy. So if you go to www.cape.ca, C-A-P-E dot C-A, um, and sign up to volunteer. We have regional committees across the country that we would love to connect you with and, and uh, uh, get you started on that. With our recent um, healthy recovery report, we have a way through the website where if you're in Canada, you can send the report to your elected official and encourage them to act on the recommendations. And that, that's obviously the website. We would, we would uh, recommend that you do that. Um, you know, I would be remiss as the leader of the organization if I didn't mention that you can also, of course, donate to our work because that's, uh, that's important and that, that's how we uh, have the resources to do the work that we do. Um, but yeah, it's, it's just the energy. It's the energy and the passion of our volunteers that keep us all going and keep us effective. Hmm. So to become a volunteer, you would go to cape.ca and then you just find become a member, right? Yes, um, exactly. Yeah. Now this interview is, is a taste, it's a, it's a small taste of all the work that you're doing, obviously. So um, for at, at the end of this interview here, um, could you, is there anything important that you think that we missed that you really would like to address here in this interview before we kind of start to close this? Loop? No, I mean, I think, this has been very comprehensive and thank you very much for all your great uh, questions. I really enjoyed discussing our, our work, but uh, I think the main thing, a great starting point is this recent healthy recovery report that we put out because it is so comprehensive. Um, so although not everyone will read the report and necessarily be animated by every little piece, if you're interested in uh, renewable energy or if you're interested in using that renewable energy to make our transportation systems uh, more sustainable or to make our our homes and buildings more sustainable, or maybe uh, you're a health professional and you're interested in making healthcare more sustainable. So there are a lot of emissions wrapped up in uh, the provision of healthcare. Uh, we've we've got a home for you here to do that. We we work on all those issues. Uh, we have people who are passionate on all those things. Um, so yeah, I, I would just encourage your your listen listenership to uh, to check out our website, get involved, and uh, just know that we can't do this work without you.